And then you got D-bags like this doing like 60 in the fast lane. Get out of the way. That dude has the right idea. I have a bit of a drive ahead of me. I'm actually going to buy the very last stick of inch and three quarter 083 wall chromoly within a 200 mile radius of Las Vegas. I've checked three different states and almost every single one of them or every supplier that I know of doesn't have the size I need because I bought all of it and now I'm going to clear it all out. But we'll get to that later. Future plans. This is something that you gotta really consider. And you notice that there are two exhaust tubes. They are 304 stainless steel, three inch in diameter. And yes, those are mild steel tabs, MIG welded, that I cut those out on the fast cut. But you also notice that it dead heads here. And if you look to the other side, it also dead heads there. These are temporary. All they are is nothing more than a placeholder that tells me where the exhaust is going to be so that I can actually bend some tubing around them and run the exhaust down the, you know, the center of the tunnel in the future. But that's future planning. Do I know exactly what I'm doing on the entire exhaust system yet? No, I just need those there so that way I don't run a tube where it's not supposed to be. Future plans are everything that is supposed to be in place to where you can actually service it, complete, uh, do your task, whatever it is, later on down the road. Now this is things like you need to know where like the alternator is going to sit because you don't want to find out later on that you couldn't, you know, remove it or even service it or even do an oil change because you ran a tube there and oops. You don't want something like that. Future plans are not things like engine management system, what suspension's going on there, or you know any of that stuff. Like if a lot of people have asked me, they say, well, hey, what are you doing for this? And I say, it doesn't matter yet. We need the foundation before we can build the roof. Speaking of building, tube number one, datum tube. Datum is a fancy way of saying start. Think of it this way, that one tube that stretches from this side to this side, straight across the bottom, is point zero. Every other tube, the main hoop, that drive shaft loop, the rear tubes, everything else that's coming off of this is all based off of the position of that datum tube right there. You need a datum in order to measure everything out, in order to attach everything else to, or at least figure out where everything else is going to go. How hard is it to put in a datum tube? Well, this is pretty much very simple. You cut one side, you cut the other one, the full length, weld it in place, and off you go. But, does it need to be bent? Where does it need to sit? Where's the first one gonna go? Does it need to be at the back of the cab or the back of the chassis or does it need to be at the front of it? Should I make a main rail beforehand? Whatever. The answer is whatever you design. You have to consider what every other tube is gonna be based around or which tube you actually have to start with. So you wouldn't necessarily want to start with a main hoop when it's supposed to attach to some other tube. So figure out which tube is going to be the one that just about every other one on your main uh, points, at least your main rails, are going to attach to. My datum tube is at the rear of the cab at the bottom. This is where the main hoop will attach to. This is where my lower main rails for the rear will attach to. It's where the drive shaft loop attached to. It's where the secondary main rails attach to. And since the main hoop attaches to it, my upper rear frame rails will attach to the main hoop. Every single one of these has to tie in somehow down into that tube. But there are some things that you need to take into consideration before installing your datum tube. In this case, I want this body removable. Once I get all the tubes up stuffed into the top of it and have that really tight, tight fit that I need to have on here, I won't be able to access the tubes if it's permanently welded to the body already. In other words, I can't drop the, the chassis down to separate it from the body and reach the top with the TIG welder. It's not going to happen. Not to mention, it's really cool when you can unbolt the body and just set that aside and cruise around with bare tubes and stuff like that. I mean, that's totally awesome. So I have to have some sort of a mounting system. In this case, it's going to be a piece of quarter inch hot rolled steel that gets welded to the inside of the body that plate will be drilled and tapped so that the mounting plate for all of the other tubes that mount to the body can be welded directly to that. At which point, all I really have to do is remove four bolts per tab and take the body off the top. This is a little bit monotonous and it's kind of tiring, so I'm only gonna show you this one, but all four of them had to be done in all four mounting locations. In order to bend up all of these tubes, if you didn't catch it earlier, it's inch and three quarter 083 wall chromoly. But in order to bend all of these, I've had to upgrade my Rogue Fab bender. Now Rogue Fab sent me this mandrel attachment for the back of it, and I'm gonna use it to bend all of my tubes here. But do I have to have it? Yes, I do have to have it. Now a mandrel bender is appropriately named off of that little bullet looking brass slug looking thing that sits inside of here. This little guy right here will actually fit inside of the tube very tightly. And as the tube gets drawn around here, it will hold the shape of the walls, which the thinner the tube, 
the more likely it's going to want to collapse on itself. Now, normally what happens when you want to bend thinner wall tubes, they'll use a much larger center line or a bigger die that goes on there. And when you do that, you have this very gradual kind of gracious bend, which I do not want to maintain on this build. I want to stick to uh, the rule of thumb or at least the tightest center line radius that I can with that. That means that I have to have something inside of this tube to hold the shape of it as I bend it. And the percentage of deformation or how much the wall collapses on a bend is very minimal. There is a slight drawback to mandrel bending and that is learning how to use it or learning how it is, your limitations, all the rest of that good stuff. Now, the initial price of it, let's just say the attachment that's on there right now, this whole unit right here is the most affordable mandrel bender in the entire world. It is a full on functional, really awesome machine, mostly mechanical, meaning you've got to do work to use it, but compare that to a machine that'll set you back about thirty, forty thousand dollars or so this is only a few thousand bucks and it does the job that's really awesome but the initial cost on that or the initial price will set you back a few but once you get that what you got to look forward to is learning how to use it now i know a lot about bending tubes and i know this bender extremely well it's one of my favorites but i've never mandrel bent before this unit i knew about it but not enough about it and that unfortunately has cost me a little bit. The first thing it's gonna cost you is a bit of time. Now, that mandrel, as you put a piece of tube on here, it literally, if you hold it like this and push on it, it's pushing air back out against my hand. It's so tightly fit that you have to clean the inside of the tubes. Inside of here, there's oil, there's dirt, there's junk, there's chips, there's whatever is inside of there. You have to clean these out. That'll take you a few extra minutes to actually do with every single tube before you bend it. You also have to clean up the outside of the tube. It has to be near perfect in order to do it. That just takes extra time. Time is money, but at the same time, <laughs> you're not gonna find anything else like this. The second thing you have to learn is your bending sequence. Sequence is the order of bends that you have to do. Now, all of these are restricted. They're limited to the amount of tubing that you can fit inside of the mandrel bender because all of them have to either be bent from one side or start to finish or like a main hoop, for example, that's too long to fit inside of the bender, you actually have to bend that from the inside or the center section outward. You basically bend one side, flip it over, and then bend the other side. But let's just say that you missed on a bend. If you bent too much, well, we know you can't unbend a bend, but if you didn't bend enough, you might not be able to get it back in there. So let's just say, for example, this piece here that has two bends in it. If I wanted a bend in the middle of it, it's not gonna happen because of this mandrel bender. If the mandrel wasn't in there, then it could happen. That's why there's a really big pile over here of chromoly. It's either it wasn't bent enough, it wasn't bent in the correct sequence, or I had some issues with it, like learning how to bend again. The harshest reality that I've really had to face on this build that a lot of people were wondering why it took me so long to make this video again, I haven't done this in two years. I've been sitting here playing businessman and making welding videos. So it's been a pretty hard lesson and a costly one. I didn't tighten the clamp block down on that one tight enough, so it slipped and kinked the tube. This was part of setting up the mandrel bender. We expect to have some waste anyway, but I can't use it because it wasn't set right. This bent and crooked main hoop right here, that was most likely because I wasn't uh, checking my angle gauge, getting a little bit too cocky on it. All of these other tubes here also have a story or a reason why they're sitting here. This is my scrap pile. It's basically cost me about $400 worth of chromoly to learn how to bend tubes again or bend them correctly using the new technology and tools that I have. Most of you guys know that I'm absolutely obsessed with technology, learning new things. I never want to get stuck in one way and stay that way forever because things are constantly evolving. Things are constantly being created. Now, Bendtech is one of those pieces of technology that I wanted to definitely try and use and incorporate into this build along with mandrel bending and a bunch of other things that we'll get to all of those later. But I met up with the guys at, uh, at Bentech over at uh, PRI in 2019. Went over to the booth, explained to them that I'm really interested in learning this, wanting to know more about it, possibly demonstrate and show it to you guys, as well as, you know, say what I think about the software. They said, well, here's a copy of it. You know, good luck, have fun with it. And I did. Ever since then, I started using it. But there's a lot of things that I don't necessarily need it for. And that's where I got a little stubborn and a little bit old school on this one. The drive shaft loop is the first one. That's a tube that's 180 degrees. That's all. All I really needed to do was bend 180 degrees. It's not rocket science. I knew through some quick math in my head the amount of material it needs to take. I know how long it needs to be before I bend it. I check it up into the bender. I bend it. Beautiful profile, by the way. Once I got that mandrel dialed in, 
notched it out on my Rogue Fab Versa notcher. And yes, for those of you who remember all the way back in the day, I was kind of, well, made famous for not using a tube notcher, for doing it by hand. And I still do that. But I had to pick up the Versa notcher a while back, about three years ago, when we started doing the roll bar and fabrication classes here at TFS. But all that aside, the Versa notcher is a really awesome machine. And out of all of the ones that I tested before getting this one, this is the only one that passed every single one of my tests. So three years later, there's your review. Getting it installed onto the datum tube was also very simple. I don't need anything to tell me what a center measurement of this is actually going to be. So all I did was mark it out, tack it in place, and move on to the main hoop. I've bent hundreds of main hoops. This is not really that difficult for me to do either. And if you want to learn how to bend a main hoop, you'll see some future videos on this, as well as the legacy videos that I have that we made in the past, like building a roll cage and everything else like that. So I didn't use the software for bending the main hoop. I just simply made my measurements, did my calculations, some really quick math, bent it up into the machine, notched it out once again on the Versa notcher, and chucked it into the truck. My original plan was to actually build the floor first, as most people would do. So I had the main rails that stretch all the way up to the front of the chassis. I had the side rails, the seat rails, the primaries, the secondaries. Everything else was already set up and ready to roll in Bentec. Print out the instructions, and that's where I started having a lot of problems. Now, I went through a lot of tubes on this one, and I have a lot of scrap, and I have a lot of footage of me goofing. And I'm not going to throw all of it in there because, well, mostly because I scrapped the footage just as fast as I scrapped the tube. But the biggest issue that I have, first and foremost, my experience. I've been doing this for almost 20 years now, and tube bending has definitely been a big part of my career. Building race cars and everything else like that, that's what I did. So when the software tells me to do this bend at this angle with this rotation and in this sequence, my brain says, oh, that's not right. I'm going to do it my way and then I learned how fast a scrap pile can grow. It's not the software's fault that I didn't listen to it. So if you actually are one of those people that is very experienced and you want to start using things like software and stuff like that, uh, follow it. It may not make a lot of sense to you and it may be in a different sequence or something else like that, but follow it. it it'll help you out a lot. The second problem I have is that I unearthed a bug, uh, very simply put, that in the software, under a very specific bending sequence, it would spit out the measurements to where they're both on the same side of the tube and in the exact same location. Now, I contacted the Bentec software engineers, I explained everything, we sat on the phone for a while, and they are very interested in solving this problem. But it is a very specific bending sequence. So the likeliness of a lot of people running into this situation is kind of minimal. So I'm not going to go over it too much, I'm going to wait for them to come up with their solution and their, their update and their, their bug fix. But it did cost me a lot of tube. I did have to bend a lot of it and goof a lot of it and throw a lot of it in the scrap pile because of this error or this bug. Now, again, not really their fault or anything like that, but it soon became evident that there is not enough material for me to actually do the floor. And that brings us to back on the road. Now, Bentec is a really unique tool, but there's a lot of misconception about it, and there's obviously some struggles and some fights and stuff like that that I'm having with it right now. As it is, as a software package and what it can do and all the rest of that stuff, it's a pretty neat bit of kit, as they usually say. But, uh, you know, you may have to sit down and realize something, and that is, it's not going to teach you how to build a chassis. It's not going to teach you how to build a roll cage. It's not going to teach you how to bend tubes. It's not going to teach you how to notch tubes. It's not going to do any of that stuff. It's a tool. Now, just like a screwdriver is meant for, you know, loosening screws and stuff like that, I mean, you have to learn how to use it, right? You have to learn that, you know, the Phillips head's not going to fit in the flathead slot unless, you know, you're a guy like me and just, you know, smacks it with a hammer and eventually something happens. But that's something you have to learn. Now, knowing all of that is how you can use the tool properly, essentially, right? So let's just take Bentec, for example, as it sits, it's a tool. It only does what you tell it to do, essentially. So if you don't know how to measure your chassis or gather those points where you're gonna, you know, put everything together, it's not gonna tell you. So in other words, you have to take your measurements and put it into the software. And then it'll tell you where your bend is going to start, you know, what's gonna happen with it, where the notches are supposed to be, and everything else like that, right? But then a lot of people jump in and say, well, if I have to measure everything, that means I have all the measurements at hand, why do I need the software? Well, you don't, that's the thing. But 
the cool thing about it is once you get into some maybe some advanced level bending or notching or anything else like that it's extremely helpful to have because it literally just streamlines your process by saying this is exactly where the bend needs to go here's exactly the angle and everything else like that so if you have some complicated stuff it will definitely uh, help you get through all that. It'll definitely show you all the stuff that you need, uh, you know, to do all that. And I have some pretty clever bending and some really wild notches, and I can calculate all this stuff all day long, but having a piece of paper tell me exactly where it goes without having to really think, that's pretty cool. The other thing is it's also very convenient to have a full model to look at, or a portion of a model to look at, so that way you can maybe change it around or screw your design up and say, well, I don't like that, I like this. You can, you know, see it all right there in person, spin it around, all that stuff, in the event that you can't do all that in your head already. But this is a nice visual tool. And it's one of those things that, ooh, Baker, hang on a second. Thank you. Well, like I was saying, it's a tool. You have to learn how to use it. And, you know, once you do, it's a good thing. But why am I still driving 200 and some odd miles to go get a uh, one piece of chromoly? Well, very, very simple. There's no more left within that amount of you know space. I checked three different states and a bunch of my different vendors and suppliers and stuff like that, and they don't have any. So I called around to a few more that were recommended, and they said, yeah, we've got one. So to make sure that this build doesn't stall any more than it already has, or have any more delays than it already has, I'm going to get the last piece that I can find until my supplier restocks. Hopefully, that doesn't, uh, <coughs> delay us <coughs> much more. <coughs> oh dear. <coughs> it may need a little bit of cleaning, but oh well. Special thanks to these guys. <coughs> time to go back to Vegas. I never really wanted this to turn into a 20 minute talking head episode, but at the same time, I didn't want to give the impression that I'm the greatest builder on YouTube and everything's fine and hunky dory in YouTube building land. It doesn't work that way. It's actually very frustrating sometimes. And if there's one video that I can put together to kind of demonstrate that, maybe it's this one. And I'm pretty sure it's not the last time that I'm going to enter into a very frustrating time. I actually took a week off. Because after I got back from California, I saw that the inside of the tube that I purchased down in SoCal uh, was rusted out. And you can't slide that over the mandrel, and I have no way of actually cleaning out the entire tube from front to back on the longer sections. So that entire stick has to be reserved for the short sections that I can actually clean the inside as well as the outside of the tube on. So I took some time off, I relaxed a little bit, and then I got to back to work on the back end of the, uh, the actual truck because that's all the material I had on hand to actually work with. And my supplier is still out of stock right now, so I'm kind of stuck. And this is just the way that it goes. 